Okay, number 14. So given that a equals 3 to the power x and b equals 3 to the power y, express in terms of a or b or a and b each of these ones. Now the logic behind this is, is to literally rewrite all these terms into exactly what they want and then attach powers or other things. So for the first one, 3 to the power 2x, since we only have 3 to the power x, we can kind of um, factorize the 2 out. So it would be something like 3 to the power x all squared. And now we know what um, 3 to the power x is. 3 to the power x is a. So it's going to be a squared. Okay. For the next part, 3 to the power x plus 4y. In this case, when you're adding powers, you can actually partition it into something like the product of power. So 3 to the power x times 3 to the power 4 power y. And now... We know what 3 to the power x is, but 3 to the power 4y is is, uh, is not what they want for b. So what you could do is literally replace 3 to the power x with a. And just like the first term, we found out that 3 to the power 2x is a squared. So 3 to the power 4y must be b4, b to the power 4. So a times b to the power 4. Okay, so that's done. Now for the last bit, same thing here. Yeah? So we're going to partition this again. So this would be 3 to the power y times 3 to the power minus 1. Well, 3 to the power y is easy, it's just going to be b. And 3 to the negative 1 is a third. So it'll be a third of b, which is b over 3. Done. Now, next bit, okay, so they bring the same info back. They tell us now that a times b gives us 2187, and a squared b gives us another result. Work out the value of x and the value of y. Show you're working clearly. Okay, so this looks like we're going to do some sort of simultaneous equations, yeah? By the way, a little quick tip here. What you could do is firstly, and solve this super easily, is to try and work out what the value of a and b is first before we work out the value of x and y, yeah? So to do this, since we know that a times b is this value here, this one is a squared b, which is the same as a times a times b equals that amount right here. So what you could do is just replace this a, b with this result here. So you're going to have a times 2187 which is 2,187a equals the right-hand side. And then you can just divide it across to solve for a. And when you do that, um, you should get exactly 81. So the value of a is 81. And now, because you know what a is, you can go ahead and make um, a, a b the subject from the first equation. Since so Because you've got a, b equals 2,187. Therefore, b equals 2,187 divided by a, which is 81. So it'll be 2187 divided by A, and you should get also 287. Okay, so that's the value A and B found. Now you've got A and B, we can literally plug it into the first equation, yeah? So we know that A to the power A equals um, 3 to the power X, B equals 3 to the power Y. So therefore, 81 equals 3 to the power X, 3 to the power of Y. Now, there's a, literally a beautiful method. Sometimes we're not too comfortable with powers, guys, yeah? And I totally get that. What we could do is use something known as logs. If you had if you had a general equation, suppose it was like a1 equals 3x, you would just divide 3 across, isn't it, to get x, which will be a1 over 3. In this case, because they're in terms of powers, we need to use a special um, button, a calculator known as the logs, or the lns, yeah, the natural logs. So yeah, to solve this nicely, we're going to use the log function, yeah? So we can say, therefore, x must equal, if you divide 3 across, log 81 over log 3 okay and if you put this in a calculator you're going to get exactly 4 likewise if you did it for y you can get y equals log 27 over log 3 and by the way guys this is actually an a-level technique here yeah? so you, you're not really supposed to know this but if you use it you, you won't get penalized so x is going to be 4 and y is going to be 3 and that's it guys problem solved all right number 15 so barney has a biased coin Okay, so it's not fair. So all properties will be different here. When the coin is thrown once, the property that will land on heads will be 0 0.3. So this means tails will be the other way around, 0 0.7. Because all properties must always add up to 1. Now, Barney throws the coins 4 times. Work at the property that the coin will land heads exactly 3 times. Okay, so for these kind of questions, it doesn't tell you the particular order how they should do it. As long as you get exactly 3 heads. So we ask ourselves, what combinations can we get? Well, you can get heads three times in a row, and the fourth one must be a tails, or you can get heads um, twice in a row, and then tails, and then heads. And you'll probably realize that you can arrange this in four different ways, yeah? So something like that. 
when this happens you're going to get the same probabilities each time so you can literally just rewrite this as four times the probability of getting three heads and the tails this will give you the same result guys now to actually solve this probability to get property heads we know 0 0.3 to get another head 0 0.3 and then 0 0.3 and then it tails 0 0.7 if you put all this in your calculator and of course times it by four because there's four outcomes of it four different ways you're going to get exactly 0 0.0756 okay so this will be your answer for a work out the probability that the coin will land heads at least once Ooh. so this one's actually a clever way of asking it what they means is that the property of getting head once so you need to get one heads and uh three tails or you can get uh two heads and two tails or three heads one tail and lastly or four heads now as nice and simple as this all looks the only problem is, is that you're going to have to work out the, the several different combinations as well which is good it's just going to be time consuming however you'll probably realize that there's actually a single combination which we never looked at which is tails 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 and this is literally the only combination you cannot get so why don't we just do this? Why don't we just find the reverse, the property of not getting heads at all? So property of getting just straight tails. If you work this out, you realize that you could just one minus that probability of getting straight tails. And it's going to equal the same result as all of these guys. That's the cool thing. And yeah, if you do that, you're going to get one minus 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 all the way across four times. And this is going to give us a final answer of according to my calculation 0 0.7599 and that's it so 120 people who visited a sports center were asked if they went swimming played basketball or used the gym all right now according to this the answers show the following so we've got like literally various combinations yeah using this information complete the venn diagram below to show the great show the number of people in each region of the venn now with this kind of question, yeah, and this is literally how we should always do it. You always try and f always work out the inside first before you go to the outside. So work out all the combinations that they all did together and then two of them doing two of the things together and then individual elements. And then we work out and see if we get the, the correct numbers. So let's start with the inside, yeah, and usually you always start at the bottom. So it tells us that two people went swimming, played basketball, used the gym. So we're going to put a nice little two there. So that's two people. Now the three before it. It says that seven people went swimming and used the gym. So seven people went swimming and used the gym. So this area here must equal seven, including the two. So this has to therefore be five, because five plus two is seven. Now the next bit says that five people played basketball and used the gym. So B and G. So five people did this area, meaning you had a difference of three that did just basketball and gym. And lastly, three people went swimming and played basketball. So again, two plus one will give us three. Now we pick the individual elements. So 27 people use the gym. So this entire G circle must equal 27. So let's add this up. So you've got 5 plus 2 plus 3, which is 10. And you've got 17 left over, making 27. According to swim, uh, basketball, 16 um, played basketball. We've got 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is 6. Um, take that away from 16, you've got 10 remainder. And lastly, for swimming, you've got 28. So 1 plus 2 plus 5 is 8. 8 take, oh, I love the numbers. 8 take away 28. 8 from 28 is 20. Okay, so now you've got all the numbers. We need to firstly check if all of this adds up to 120 people, yeah? Now, just looking at numbers, it doesn't look like even close to 120. But if you actually added up every single value here, you'll realize that they're all together 58 included in these three sports. Now, this is nowhere near 120. So this means that out of these 120 students, if you subtract them from 58, 62 were doing different things. And that's it. That's literally all you have to do. Now, finally, for part B, it says one of the people who went swimming, i.e. one of the people. So we're talking about a collection of just this group here only now. is chosen at random. Find the property that this person out of the swimming group also played basketball. So let's have a look. How many people play basketball in that swimming group? Well, you got here and here. So you got a total of three. So you got a total of three students out of that swimming group, which is 28. And that's your probability, guys. This is literally done. Okay, number 17. So we got P 
equals EF, where both E and F have been rounded to two single figures. They want us to find the lower bound value of P. So in other words, the lower bound value of EF together. Now to do this, and before we even look at it, we need to firstly work out what the upper and lower bounds are for E and F. So on the right hand side, let's put E and F here for a second here yeah, and put some bounds. So it's always less than equal to the left and, ju and just less than on the right. Why? It's because when you're rounding from an upper value, it can't be a certain number. It has to be just below that. Whereas for a lower bound value, it can also equal it. And you'll see. So to work out the upper bounds, it's always easy. Just copy these numbers out on the right side. That's my trick. So copy this down and then just add a 5 across. To find the lower bound value, you'll realize that the difference between 4.85 and 4.8 is going to be 0 0.05. So just subtract this number from the low, from this 4.8 to get the lower bound, which is 4.75. Again, the difference between 0 0.265 and 0 0.26 is also 0 0.005. Minusing that across from the original value, you can get 0 0.255. Another way to see this trick is to just realize that this unit value goes down by 1, and then this unit value goes down by 1, and that's it. Now... Let's try and solve the question. So to get the lower bound value of P, we need to ask ourselves, what, how do we multiply E and F to make it so tiny? Well, the trick is, is to get the smallest possible value of E and multiply against the smallest possible value F. So in other words, the minimum value of E times the minimum value of F, which is these two values. And when you do that, you're going to get exactly, so just write it step by step, 4.75 times uh, 0.255 you're going to get exactly uh, to, to three senior figures, 1.21. And that's it. That's A done. Now for B, it's the same thing. But now you've got division. So again, or, but then that, now it's been rounded slightly to different number of places. But here they want to work out the upper bound for the value of Q. So once again, let's put T and W on the side. Put some bounds here. So less than equal, less than equal, and just less than here. And now... Once again, copy these digits out. So T is 2.73 and 0 0.04. Add a 5 to both. And then subtract this unit by 1, yeah? So it would be 2.725, 0 0.035. So that's bounds done. Now, to work out the upper value of Q, we need to ask ourselves, how do we maximize T over W? Well, when you now here's a little rule of thumb. When you're dividing or subtracting terms, the, greatest, the, the way to obtain the greatest value is to find the greatest um, gap between T and W. In other words, to get the maximum value of Q, so the max of Q, we need to maximize T and get the, in other words, get the biggest value of T and divide it by the smallest possible value W. Why? Because this, this means that the ratio between them, the, diff, the gap, is really big. So you've got to get the biggest value. So the maximum value of T is this value and the minimum value of W is here. So it'd be 2.735 over 0.035. Now, if you put this in the calculator, hopefully you're going to get 78. And I believe that's it. So here is the graph of y equals sine x for x between 0 and 360. Okay, so here's your graph here. On the grid above, sketch the graph of y equals sine x plus 90. Okay, for 0 to 360. All right, so what is this telling us? And this is very specific because they even tell us where you should sketch it between. This x plus 90 means that this entire graph has shifted by 90 degrees. Now, the question is, is it left or right? The trick to remember, if you remember this general form, f x plus a, when you, when you write like this, you always shift to the opposite sign. So if we said plus a, it's going to shift to the left by minus a. Yeah? That's what it means. It's kind of like when you're solving quadratics. If you put in a bracket, your answer is always opposite. So if we said x plus 90, shift to the graph by minus 90 degrees. Moving this graph 90 degrees to the left, we look at each point. This point goes here now by, to minus 90. 90 goes to 1. So actually, I'm going to just change the color of the pen. Uh, 180 here goes here now. 270, which is over here, goes here. Uh, 360, move here. Okay, and now we can just kind of predict it. So I just literally mess this up. So we've got this, this. So it looks something like that. Okay, so just carefully sketch along. And you can kind of guess what the next one is. It's going to, of course, shoot up to here. Now, 
for this kind of question it says sketch between 0 to 360 so in other words we can't sketch anything less than because if you do you might get penalized i don't know but my tip is stick to the range they want which is from 0 to here okay let's move on to the next one okay in the range between 0 and 360 for x the graph of y equals sine x over 2 plus 3 has a maximum point a okay just let's understand this maximum for a second yeah a maximum means the highest um, point on the curve like here so the maximum sine x would have been um, when x is 90 and y is 1 that's an example they want us to find the maximum of this point here of this curve now the trick is when you write like this it, it can be done super easily this plus 3 means that the y uh, curve has gone up by 3 so now instead of it being at 1 it's going to go up by 3 points higher so the maximum will now be at something 4 okay so that's a y coordinate for a second yeah as for the x coordinate, it gives us a hint. So remember how for sine x plus 90, we do the reverse. Here you do the reverse as well. If you divide them by 2 it for inside the bracket, it's like you multiply x coordinates by 2 instead. So all the x values are now multiplied by 2. So that means if the original maximum point was 90, if you double this, you're going to get 180. So it's going to be 180 degrees. And that's it. I mean, visually, if you want to know what it looks like visually, let's just pretend this is 4 for a second, yeah? This means that the old x value has been doubled. So instead of hitting at 90, it's going to now hit at 180. Instead of hitting the, uh, the x-axis at 180, it's going to hit at 360. And so on. So you can kind of see it's like a massive change. But yeah, so the answer you want is 180 and 4. Okay, number 19, guys. So it tells us that we got a quadrilateral here, and they want us to find the area of this entire shape. Now, conveniently, they literally cut a line across from D to B, meaning we got two triangles. So, essentially, we need to find the area of both these triangles. Now, to do that, we need to use this formula. The area of the triangle, and this is and this is also given in the from the booklet, is um, half AB sine C. So, what this means visually is that if you had a normal triangle like that, you have the length AB, and you've got an angle between it C. We can work out the area of the triangle. So what we really want is we want an angle between two lengths. Now, it, it, you can do it in, any, in literally many different ways, but we're going to try and find the shortest way, yeah? I think the best way to do is firstly work out this length DB to begin with, yeah? So let's call this X. If we can work out this length, we can work out this angle here, which is quite straightforward since we've got these two angles ready. And if you have this length already, we have another length here and an angle between. So then that's it. We just work out X and we're done. Now to do this one and using the top triangle, we can use something known as the sine rule. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and re-sketch this for a second, yeah? Just to make it easy on eyes. So you got 97 here, and you got uh, 58 here. You got a length opposite 97, and you got another length opposite 58, 9.3. Okay, so the way this, the way the sine rule works is that if you have a, a length opposite angle, you can apply it. And the sine rule tells us that if it's A, that the formula is something like A over sine of the angle a equals b over sine b and we just literally substitute everything in so the first little a is going to be x it'll be x over the sine of 97 equals length b let's say 9.3 over its opposite sine 58 and now all you do is is just rearrange the formula and make x a subject so to do that we need to clear the fraction we need to time sine 97 across so x is going to equal 9.3 over sine 58 times sine 97 and now just put on your calculator guys yeah you should get about 10.8846 dot 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 i wouldn't round the answers yet here yeah? we're going to round it on the very last step so now we found the value x here so let's update this so this this is now about what did i say it was 10.88 yeah let's just make it for uh, two decimal places so we can now work out this angle here, which is quite straightforward. So we've got all angles add up to make um, 180. So we've got 97 plus 58. That gives us uh, 155. Minus it from 180, you should get you should be left with 25 degrees here. Now we can finally apply this area of a triangle formula to the first triangle here. Yeah? So we can say that the area of this first triangle, let's call it A1, the first triangle, is going to be half times this two um, length, so 9.3 and 10.88. 9.3 10.88 times sine 25 and then putting this in your calculator you, you're going to get a total area of 
21.38 centimeters squared. So that's just the first area, A1, yeah? And now we repeat the same thing, yeah? So let me change the colors. We got, we got an angle between two lengths. So we got 11.2 and again, 10.88 and this angle here. So the same formula applies. So the second area is going to be half times A, which is, let's say, 10.88 and then B and then times sine C. 44.5589 and that's it and now to work at the total area just add up these two numbers yeah and if you round it up to what is it three significant figures you should get a total area of 65.9 65.9 yep and that's it i hope this is right